photography. Thank you, Bjorn. So I'd like to take this opportunity. This is uh, my third and last lecture here. I just want to thank the organizers again. Thanks to Bjorn and Akshay and Jen for organizing a great um, summer school and for including me in the program. And thanks to all of you for coming. Um, so uh, just as a reminder, in the um, first two lectures yesterday, so I introduced uh, super singular isogeny graphs and cryptography. Um, in For any of you that missed it, I showed this nice picture from Science Magazine from 2008, um, which we created, which is a picture of a very small super singular isogeny graph. Um, so just so you kind of get this intuition of a uh, very, very messy looking graph that's hard to navigate. And so in the first lecture, we covered both cryptography and kind of some number theory, elliptic curves from a high level, um, and the, the impending quantum threat, and we defined a hash function um, from super singular isogeny graphs. And then in the second lecture, we actually talked about these graphs from the perspective of expander graphs and the expansion property and the optimal expansion property of being a Ramanujan graph. And then we talked about the application, which was key exchange, so being able to do a key exchange using these graphs. So in this lecture, um, I'd like to focus a little bit on quaternion algebras, which I've mentioned why that's relevant. We'll get get back to that and repeat that here. And an algorithm for attacking um, these cryptographic proposals, which works in the qu uh, quaternionic setting. And um, some of the recent um, work coming out of that direction. And then talk about a third application, um, which is signatures. So in each of the three lectures, I'm attempted to cover like one or more whole <laughs> branches of mathematics and some applications. So I know I know it's a lot, but hopefully uh, you're, you find some things in each that um, you find interesting. So um, first let's uh, go back to why, why are we going to talk about quaternions? Well, the reason is because uh, our graph, our super singular isogeny graph, the vertices are super singular elliptic curves, or at least um, isomorphism classes of super singular elliptic curves. And what is a super singular elliptic curve? Well, one way to define it is that its endomorphism ring is a maximal order in a quaternion algebra, in a definite quaternion algebra, BP infinity. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about w what that quaternion algebra looks like and what these orders look like um, in next in the beginning of this talk. And the reason is because we have this beautiful uh, Durings correspondence uh, which allows us to think about the graph instead of having its uh, nodes are elliptic curves and its edges are isogenies, we can think of its nodes or vertices as being maximal orders in the quaternion algebra by just mapping an elliptic curve to its endomorphism ring and then um, instead of isogenies what we have is connecting ideals of certain norm and that's that's what replaces um, isogenies of a certain degree in in um, in the the description of the graph that I've been focused focused on yesterday and as I mentioned uh, yesterday uh, another fact that we use in cryptography is what is the size of this graph so if you fix P and you look at super singular elliptic curves in, in characteristic P, then thinking of the description of the graph in terms of maximal orders in, a quat in the quaternion algebra BP infinity helps us because we have the Eichler class number, which tells us that the number of nodes is roughly P over 12. And that allows us to figure out what size P we should use in order to get a certain amount of security because it tells us how big is the graph. Okay, so now let's talk about quaternion algebras. And uh, as you can see, I mean, I don't have time to do a whole course on quaternion algebras. So just like in the elliptic curve case, I'm just giving a very, very simplified description of the objects that we're going to work with. So this uh, definite quaternion algebra, which is ramified at P and infinity, BP infinity is the notation we use for this. You can simply think of this as um, being given by a basis of four elements, one, i, j, and k, much less 
like, like the Hamiltonian quaternions. But this time, uh, we have that I squared is actually equal to A, J squared is equal to B, and K is IJ, which is the same as minus JI. And depending on the congruence class of P, we can say, we can give what the choices of A and B should be. So just for the sake of giving you some examples to work with, um, and you'll do some, some exercises related um, to these definitions in, in the next problem session, um, the, the, we're going to just focus on the case where P is congruent to 3 mod 4, where um, A and B are then minus P and minus 1. So if you look at that, I actually um, uh, th think it's, it's kind of interesting. So all the elements in the quaternion algebra will be written in terms of this basis, 1, i, j, and k. And so th that just means that, um, I forgot, <laughs> I have to look and see which one I've picked for which, but i squared is now minus p, j squared is minus 1, and um, k squared is also minus p. Okay, so that's the quaternion algebra that we're working in. And so there's a couple of important um, things about this quaternion algebra. First is that we have an involution. So uh, if you take a, some written in terms of the basis, if you take x, which is written in terms of its basis, 1, i, j, k, and you just um, take all of, the, uh, all of the basis elements other than 1 and multiply them by minus 1, then you get a, an involution so x goes to x star and that allows us to um, define uh, both a trace and a norm map we call it, they're usually called reduced trace and reduced norm but I notice there can be some confusion um, because people often just say trace and norm in the quaternion algebra um, so for example in this case when p is congruent to 3 mod 4 if you have some element written in terms of that basis that I described where um, i squared was uh, minus p and j squared was minus 1, then the norm of an element, the reduced norm of the element, um, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll probably usually forget to say reduced norm, I'll just say norm, um, adding to the confusion. But the norm is just c, uh, of an element c plus dj plus fi plus gij is just c squared plus d squared plus p times f squared plus g squared. Okay, so now that's just an abstract, you know, a little bit of background in, in uh, quaternion algebra that we're going to be working in. But now think about it in the cryptographic setting. P is huge, right? So what that means is, is that generically elements in this quaternion algebra have enormous norm. And if they have small norm, well, very interesting. That means only C and D could have contributed to this norm, if the norm is small compared to P. So that means you're actually in a, qu a commutative suborder of the quaternion algebra, which is kind of interesting. So it's actually this fact that this was the intuition that allowed us um, in my work with Yal Gorin to prove bounds on primes of bad reduction in G for genus 2 CM curves. Um, so that was kind of, that's why it's one of my favorite facts to, uh, <laughs> to talk about. But so um, when P is large, um, elements of small norm come from a commutative quad um, quadratic suborder. So another reason for mentioning that fact is that um, the quaternion algebra is rank four, and we representing elements in it with the with this basis with with four coefficients. But the fact is 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 that there's a lot of quadratic subfields that sit inside of this quaternion algebra, and so that we'll, we'll come back to that f fact when we're thinking about the um, the graph again. Um, so another important fact, which I've already alluded to, is is that this norm map on the quaternions actually corresponds to the degree map on uh, endomorphisms. So in this Durings correspondence where an endomorphism ring for an elliptic curve uh, corresponds to a maximal order in the quaternion algebra, an endomorphism in there, the degree of that endomorphism actually is equal to the norm of the element that it corresponds to under this correspondence. So, And that's another fact that we use very heavily.
Okay, so just some very brief high level, um, you know, uh, background on quaternion orders and ideals because there's some things that are non-intuitive here um, from, the, from the, if you're used to just the commutative side of things with number fields and, um, and uh, number rings and, and ideals. Um, so a fractional ideal in the quaternions is really just a rank four lattice. And then the norm of, an, of the ideal is going to be the Z module generated by reduced norms of elements of that lattice. And then an order is actually a fractional ideal, which is also a subring. So the ideal themselves are not necessarily subrings. And in fact, if you look at integral elements, which are um, elements which have their reduced norm in um, the reduced norm and trace in Z, integral elements do not even necessarily form a ring. So you can already see there's a couple things that are a little different here from that when you're working in uh, number fields. So an important concept that I need to define is the right order of a fractional ideal. So if you have a fractional ideal I, then the right order, we're going to call it O sub o R. So I'm often going to be using this script O for an order. O sub R is the elements in BP infinity such that if you multiply the ideal on the right by that element, that you still get end up staying within the ideal. So I times alpha is actually contained in I. And so I know these are a lot of definitions and a, and a lot of things and luckily Yana has designed a lot of nice exercises to kind of go over these things and get a little practice and a little bit of familiarity if you're not already. But um, uh, the reason that I need to define these things is because I, I need to, to explain what is a connecting ideal. So, because this is very key for the definition of the graph on this side of things. So, given two maximal orders, a connecting ideal, uh, maximal orders are, let's call them O1 and O2. So, connecting ideal I has the property that its right order is O1 and its left order is O2. Left order is defined analogously to the right order where you just multiply on the left instead of the right. So what that means is that um, you can actually think of um, instead of thinking of the set of um, maximal orders in the quaternion algebra, you can also think of it as fixing one maximal order and then think of all the connecting ideals that represent um, getting to the other maximal orders. So in that sense, you can think of it as like a, a kind of a class group where you've, you've, you've got a fixed reference point, which is an one initial uh, maximal order. And now you have all the left ideals, uh, all, all of the possible left ideals of that or order and their right orders give you all of the rest of the maximal orders so now like we're reducing to thinking of our graph in the in, in this new way where all the nodes are these orders and the connectors are these are these ideals and you can actually um, compute these ideals these connecting ideals so way back in the in the last century like in the end of the 1990s, um, David Cole already implemented these things in, in Magma, in the Magma software package. And um, so you can actually compute these, um, all of these maximal orders and these connecting ideals. And now it's in, in Sage, although I'm not exactly sure um, who has written it. And just as a little bit of a warning, I mean, with the development of Sage, over time there have been times when some of these uh, functions were not actually working in, in Sage, so hopefully they're working now. But um, So they were originally implemented in, in Magma by, by David Cole, and um, so you can compute these um, connecting ideals. Um, for example, you can see in the um, reference uh, by Kirschner, Kirschmer and, Vo and Voigt, which I have the list of some of the quaternion references is in the end of this slide. Um, you can see there's an explicit way to compute this, this connecting ideal.
Okay, so now just to review again during Durings correspondence. So specifically, um, it's a correspondence between these super singular elliptic curves over FP bar up to isomorphism with the maximal order, which is the endomorphism ring of the elliptic curve up to conjugation. And so uh, the, in terms of the label, I told you we had really nice labels over on the elliptic curve side. We can label elliptic curves with their J invariant, um, but we actually don't have such a nice label over on the maximal order side. So you can give a basis of a maximal order, but then you need to have a way, like if you're actually gonna use this in, in a cryptographic setting, you need to have a, a way of testing uh, whether a, a basis, you know, two different um, bases that are uh, given to you, whether they actually correspond to the same order. And that was one of our problems also when generalizing this to higher dimensions um, and using uh, super special orders. So now the correspondence for the edges is, as I said, any left ideal I of O will correspond to an isogeny. And that isogeny will have the property that the elliptic curve that you um, land on, call it E sub I, um, will have its endomorphism will be the right order of that ideal I. And um, so another way to um, see the correspondence is, is that that isogeny is actually defined by, and again, remember, all our isogenies are separable because we always take degree, which is co-prime to the characteristic. And so the isogeny is actually determined by its kernel. And so the, its kernel is given by all the points on the original elliptic curve E, um, such that um, the uh, all of the elements of this ideal, which are endomorphisms, um, kill P. So it's all the points killed by the endomorphisms in I. And um, so this is the this is the during correspondence. If the degree were not co-prime to the characteristic, this would be significantly uglier. But we're just ignoring that case for now. Um, so um, we have a one-to-one -one co correspondence in this case when the degree is co-prime to P. And as I said, the right order of I will be the endomorphism ring of E sub I. Okay, so let's look again at our kind of running example here. So if P is congruent to three mod four, and we're gonna take the elliptic curve E sub zero, which is Y squared equals X cubed plus X, is uh, super singular in this case, when P is congruent to three mod four, with J invariant 1728. So this E zero is gonna be important for us. Somebody asked after my first lecture, how do you decide what starting point to use for the walk for either the hash function or the key exchange or whatever. And I said to my chagrin that most often we use um, one of these starting points, in fact, E0, like 1728. Um, and uh, I feel and others feel that this, there may be um, a disadvantage from the security point of view of doing this, but we have not really figured out any specific weakness based on this yet, or not that I know of anyway. Um, so uh, we have this E0 as a special point in this graph anyway. It's literally the starting point usually for a lot of these protocols. Um, so what's special about this E0? Well, look at the equation, y squared equals x cube plus x. It's particularly simple, right? You can actually see what the extra endomorphisms are because you can take, um, so my, um, when you're working on elliptic curves over FP, you always have the Frobenius endomorphism. So you always have this rank two, um, you know, Z module in, inside the endomorphism ring. But for the super singular case, you have extras. And in this case, we have um, that you can send a point X comma Y on the elliptic curve to minus x comma i y, where i is the usual square root of minus one. So um, that gives you an extra endomorphism, and these two um, endomorphisms together generate this rank four uh, Z module, which is non-commutative, so generated by one phi pi and pi phi. Um, so I'll just mention a, a little bit of an issue um, in this field. There's a lot of people working in isogeny-based cryptography now. 
And one thing that happens is, is that we often talk about being able to compute the endomorphism ring, explicitly compute it, like meaning explicit during correspondence, not just that there exists a correspondence, but given an elliptic curve, a super singular elliptic curve, what is its endomorphism ring? But that's actually not really very well defined. And so in one of our um, papers with, with, um, with Christophe Petit, and um, Kirsten Eisentrager and um, Sean Hallgren and, and Travis Morrison, we actually s explain, like, there's actually three different things you could mean by that when you say compute the endomorphism ring. So here you see an endomorphism ring, which is presented in terms of explicit endomorphisms. Um, and on previous slides, I was giving you, you know, this description of the quaternion algebra in terms of a quaternionic basis. So you could mean compute it actually as a max order, which is kind of what's implied in the in the during correspondence. And so it's um, it's not really even it's, it's not at all the same thing to be able to compute um, these things. And in fact, in this case for E0, it's really a really nice case because we have O0, the maximal order, given in terms of its presentation in the quaternion algebra. So it has a basis 1 i, 1 plus k over 2, i plus j over 2, but it also has this presentation in terms of actual endomorphisms that act on points on the curve. Um, so um, beware of this kind of uh, point of confusion. Um, but this makes E0 particularly useful for um, the attacks that I'm ab about to uh, explain. So the first thing I'd like to explain is um, what's now called the KLPT algorithm, um, which was our paper from ANTS 2014 with David Cole, um, Christophe Petit, and um, Tignol. And um, so this algorithm is an algorithm which allows us to find paths in the quaternionic version of this graph. So now instead of SIG graph, we've got the quaternion version of it. And so instead of two elliptic curves that you want to find a path between, you've got two maximal orders. So O1 and O2, and you want to find a connecting ideal of L power norm, where, where L is the, um, the small prime that we've picked for it to be the degree of the isogenies and to be the, the norm of the ideals. So you want to find a connecting ideal of L power norm. And so the algorithm, um, the KLPT algorithm for this is, um, so we're going to use O0. And we're going to use the fact that we know the endomorphism ring for O0. And so we're going to find a connecting ideal um, between um, O0 and O1, one of our points. And we're going to find a connecting ideal between um, O0 and O2. And so we're going to do this, this step one. Uh, twice. So for the first run through, we're f we find the connecting ideal between O0 and O1, and then what we actually need to do is to find an equivalent ideal of norm um, L to the N. And so we do this by, if, if we have an element alpha of the, of the ideal, we can replace um, by uh, the ideal times gamma, where gamma is um, the involution applied to that element alpha um, over n, where n is the, um, the norm of i. And what we need is we need to find an alpha which is uh, norm prime to n. And for that part, we actually s search, search through this box, um, solving, trying to solve the norm equation using Cornacius algorithm. So um, uh, I think that um, the this is a little bit diving into the weeds here, but for um, I was asked about whether um, we could make this algorithm deterministic. Um, and right now, this is the step which is not deterministic, where we're looking for um, a solution to uh, the norm equation uh, using Karnatch's algorithm. Um, and so then, we, we, I'm not going through all the details here, but basically we use strong approximation to find an equivalent ideal with L power norm. So uh, as you can see, this is you know diving into the quaternions and really using a lot of um, information and facts that we have about quaternion and quaternion ideals. Um, but it's it's doable in practice and it works and it's efficient. And so and we have like heuristic analysis of the running time. Um, but um, so we can 
you know, repeat this step for connecting O0 to O2, and then we can concatenate the two paths. So this shows that in practice, you really can solve this pathfinding problem in the quaternionic version of the graph. So what that means is that um, essentially, uh, I haven't you know, exactly proved everything, but I've tried to explain to you the idea behind the statement that the hard problem in super singular isogeny graphs is basically equivalent to being able to compute these um, endomorphism rings. So the, the number theoretic algorithm, so in the second lecture, I described generic algorithms for, for attacking the um, pathfinding problem. That is, you would just start from your two endpoints and you would just randomly walk around the graph until you, the two paths hit each other. So the kind of more number theoretic approach to attacking is to use this uh, during, during correspondence, if it were explicit, and then use the KLPT algorithm to find the path and then pull it, pull it back. So, luckily for the security of the crypto systems, like Psyche, based on the hardness of these problems, computing endomorphism rings is very hard. <laughs> so, um, I think one of the first um, attempts to understand the, um, a hard, the hardness or the, the problem of computing endomorphisms of super singular elliptic curves was in uh, David Cole's thesis in 1996. And the, their idea there was just kind of random walk around to find uh, cycles in the graph and then try those cycles if you start from E and you get a cycle and you come back to E then that's actually an endomorphism so that's an exponential algorithm um, so in 2003 um, concurrently with Servino in some joint work with McMurdy uh, we ha gave another exponential algorithm for computing endomorphisms which is again really horrible so when I say exponential I mean exponential in P so that is really bad so, um, uh, compute the number of norm, um, so what, what you can do on one side is to compute the number of norm n elements in a particular maximal order and because you know what the, the norm equation is and then you can compare that with the number of isogenies of degree n which are endomorphisms. So you kind of build up this correspondence where you can match up um, an endomorphism ring for a specific elliptic curve with a maximal order. But it's, this is again, it's a, a really horrible algorithm. It's an exponential time algorithm. Um, but it uses that correspondence between degree of isogenies degree of isogenies and norm, reduced norm of elements in the quaternion. So anyway, there's been a lot of recent work on this equivalence between the, so the, the, one of the more recent papers by Benjamin Wislowski is actually called the super singular isogeny path and endomorphism ring problems are equivalent. So you can see right in the title of it. And it's a more rigorous version of our paper from Eurocrypt from I think 2018 with Eisentrager, Halgren, um, Morrison and Petit, which um, uh, showed that result as well heuristically. Um, and then s there's been some more work coming out of actually a Win4 project that was led by Kirsten Eisentrager, um, which goes towards trying to um, continue to understand the hardness of computing um, endomorphism rings. So I put the references in here in case you're interested. So that's one approach, is to try to compute endomorphism rings, and that would be one way to attack the problem. So there are a few kind of newer attack strategies um, that I've been involved in. Actually, in um, a, a problem session at the um, uh, Silverberg uh, conference a few years ago, um, I uh, co-organized a, a group um, to work on this problem, and um, we spent several years working together and wrote this paper, Adventures in Super Singular Land, which is um, in honor of uh, Alice Silverberg and, and her birthday. Um, and in that paper, um, actually, and so um, one of the interesting things there is, is that before that work, I always thought about the super singular isogeny graph like the picture from Science Magazine that I showed you, right? Just this really messy graph, like no orientation, how do you find your way around? But after that paper, I realized, of course, there's this uh, involution which we studied and the 
spine of the graph. So the spine, what we called the spine, is really the, the FP points in the graph. So um, when you look at that involution, um, the involution will um, fix the FP graph. So it'll take like uh, a J invariant to its conjugate. And if the elliptic curve is defined over FP squared, then it takes the elliptic curve to a different elliptic curve. But if the elliptic curve is defined over FP, then the J invariant is F in FP and it's fixed by this involution. So now we have a graph which thinks it looks a little different, right? That it has an involution on it and it's fixed. The fixed points of the involution are the points that are defined over FP. And so um, in that paper, Adventures in Super Singular Land, we did a lot of experimentation and there's a lot of um, interesting data and results there. Um, for example, how hard is it to navigate to a point on the spine if you're in some random place on the graph? Um, but another thing that we investigated there is um, that if you think of the volcanoes that come from the ordinary graphs, so I haven't talked about this topic in this set of lectures, so um, I apologize for bringing in something that's not really very well explained here. But um, if you look at elliptic curves which are um, ordinary over FP and they have CM by a particular field, K let's call it, there's a volcano associated with um, all of the different um, possible kind of suborders of, um, of the ring of integers of K, which correspond to the endomorphism rings of all kinds of elliptic curves. And there's a rim where all of the elliptic curves have uh, maximal order in, in K as their endomorphism ring, and then there's kind of tentacles that go down, and that's why it's for the, the elliptic curves that have suborders as their ring of integers. So that's why it's called a volcano. And volcanoes are much easier to navigate, of course, than the super singular isolation graph because there's kind of a top there's a rim and then there's branches that go down like a tree so that's why the um, problem of working on on an, on an ordinary graph is much easier than the super singular isogeny graph but what we investigated in this paper is the fact that you can see these volcanoes kind of being embedded from different CM fields that live inside the quaternion algebra you can see these volcanoes showing up in different places and um, the interesting thing is is that the way that they embed into this super singular isogeny graph is is very non-trivial so the three things that can happen is is that they can stack on top of each other um, they can fold over or they can attach to each other and so the volcanoes are sitting inside the the super singular isogeny graph in a very interesting way which we described completely in that paper and so I think uh, there's at least uh, Christina Nelson and Yana uh, um, Sotokova here as co-authors on that paper if you want to talk more about that paper. Um, and then the other paper that I wanted to talk about that um, goes in a little bit different direction but somewhat related is my uh, Win5 um, project um, co-led by Kate Stang. And Kate Stang is, I'm not going to say too much because she's going to be giving a whole talk on this paper um, uh, next week. Um, and But it kind of builds on this idea that if you have an endomorphism that corresponds to the embedding of uh, CM field K into the quaternion algebra. So you actually know an endomorphism, you know, a non-trivial, non, not Frobenius endomorphism of your, of your elliptic curve, then you can use um, the volcanoes that correspond to that CM field um, in, uh, embedded into the super singular isogeny graph, and you can use that volcano to, uh, to actually trace around and find cycles, and we can use it to actually find paths by having from two directions, both going up to the rim and hitting each other eventually and then getting back to the starting point. So that's a, another kind of interesting direction, but as you can see, again, it requires the knowledge of um, some information about the endomorphism ring. And for that paper, besides Kate, we also have uh, Mingji Chen here, who's a co-author you can talk to. Um, okay, so finally, in the last part of my talk, um, what I wanted to do is to um, talk about um, 
the third application of supersingular isogeny graphs, which is um, these signature schemes. So uh, originally um, designed by um, Galbraith, Petit, and Silva in 2016, and then um, with the uh, more recent uh, construction in uh, ski sign. Oh, so I, I was saying SQI sign, but I, I guess they say ski sign in in 2020. So the setup for ski sign for for getting a signature scheme is going to be um, that we're going to fix a prime p and the elliptic curve e zero, which is the usual one, the special one that I told you about, defined over f p with known endomorphism ring o zero, and then we're going to select a, a d, which is an odd smooth number d with which is fairly large, so log p bits, and then for the key generation, what's going to happen is that the prover is going to take a random isogeny walk from E0, landing up at EA. And the prover will make EA public and keep the isogeny itself secret. So this should look familiar to you. That's like the first stage for Alice or Bob when they're doing a key exchange. They start from some known elliptic curve, and they take their secret isogeny walk, and they make the, the, the landing point, the ending point public, but they keep the isogeny um, secret private. Okay, and so then here is how you can create an identification protocol for, um, from this. So what's going to happen is the, the prover, in addition to have, having this secret isogeny and this, the, the public key corresponding to it, is also is going to um, generate a random uh, or well I guess it's not send, sends it to the the commitment is this secret isogeny it doesn't necessarily send it to the verifier but just makes it public and then the challenge is going to be the verifier sends um, a cyclic isogeny from the ending point of the secret walk um, and that a cyclic isogeny will have um, degree D and the the challenge the verifier is going to send that challenge to the prover and then the response is that the um, let me just show you the picture here so let me see if I can get my cursor so starting from E0 the public point tau was the secret isogeny and then um, we're gonna have this commitment which is a different isogeny phi to E1, a different elliptic curve, that's sent from the prover to the verifier. Then the verifier is going to send this challenge isogeny phi, which goes from E1 to some other elliptic curve, E2. And so now, in order to respond, what the what the uh, the prover is doing is basically proving that she knows this tau by taking the dual isogeny of tau, and starting from EA, taking the dual going up to E0, and composing with these two, um, she can come up with this isogeny sigma, which is the composition of these three. So that's this this formula here. Sigma is um, phi composed with psi composed with um, tau dual, which goes from EA to E2, and it has the right properties, which is that it'll have um, degree uh, D and such that um, phi dual composed with sigma is cyclic. So the verifier can then check um, did the did the prover um, provide an isogeny from um, EA to E2 and does it have the right properties so that's how you can create uh, kind of a, a, an identification scheme which is a building block for a for a, um, a signature scheme from from these graphs and again you can see that it relies on the hardness of given E like in this picture given EA and e, E0 can you find a path between E0 and EA Okay, so then what I, I wanted to conclude with um, a little bit of information about what else has been going on in this field. So we proposed super singular isogeny graphs more than 15 years ago, 2005. Um, and not much was happening until the, um, the proposal for key exchange with um, Zhao DeFeo Plut and the advent of the search for post quantum crypto schemes. So when it was realized that this could be a post quantum assumption. Um, but uh, so as you can see from 
from some of the results I've described, in the, in the meantime, there was always those of us, like myself, interested in hardness of computing, the endomorphism ring, and um, these related problems, and also um, describing some of the um, kind of number theoretic um, analogs of, of these graphs. So, um, that, but there's been a lot of other, other graphs that have also been considered. Um, so I wanted to just give a few pointers to some references um, for work in that direction. Um, so, of course, one of the first things is, you know, you can vary the isogeny degree. And as you see um, already in the key exchange, you use isogeny degrees, what, which are two or three, but you can use even larger degrees. Um, so in our original proposal for cryptographic hash functions from expander graphs, we also proposed using lubatsky phillips -Sarnak, sarnak graphs, which are also Ramanujan graphs that have optimal expansion properties. So we thought, oh, these could be good, and they're much um, more efficient to implement because the LPS graphs are actually just, the vertices are just elements of um, SL2FP, so they're just two by two matrices with elements with their entries in FP that satisfy certain properties. And those are actually Cayley graphs. So the connectors, the, the edges, are just are, um, obtained by multiplying um, on one side by a fixed set of basically L plus one um, different matrices that satisfy certain properties. And that's how you can move around the graph. It's just a Cayley graph. You multiply on the right by these these generators of the, of the Cayley graph. So that was that was a really nice idea because wow, that's really efficient to implement compared to you know implementing elliptic curves and and J invariants and isogenies and stuff. Um, but here's the problem. This was pretty interesting. So in 2008 already in um, Eurocrypt 2008, Zemmer and Tillich um, produced a way to um, find cycles in this graph. And it was kind of analogous. There had been hash functions defined based on um, other Cayley graphs um, that usually they use the kind of the, the basic strategy for those attacks for on um, the other Cayley graphs had been um, that you uh, kind of lift the elements so they're not, you've got two by two matrices and the entries are in FP, but you lift the elements to Z and then you use kind of like a Euclidean algorithm um, to attack them. And Zemmer and Tillich were quite familiar with that and they had um, that in their mind and they were able to make that work to find cycles in the LPS graph. And um, so it, that was pretty quick uh, and made it so very unlikely to want to use LPS graphs for, for hash functions. And in fact, following on that right away in joint work with um, Christophe Petit and um, Jean-Jacques Quiscate, uh, we were able to extend their idea to actually find pre-images in these graphs, which is, uh, if you remember, finding pre-images is the same idea as finding paths. So you have a starting point that everybody knows, and now you're given some ending point for the hash function, and finding a pre-image means just what did you put into the hash function so that you landed up at that point, and that means you found the path between them. So um, a really interesting note, and this is um, an intersection of two very, very different fields coming together here in a very interesting way is that our pathfinding algorithm for LPS graphs, first of all, that had been, Lubatsky was at a, a conference at IPAM in, in 2008 where um, he had invited me to speak on this algorithm and he said that he was very pleased because this pathfinding algorithm, this pathfinding problem had been open for several decades for finding, being able to find paths in LPS graphs. And in fact, the approach that we used, um, um, Peter Sarnak has uh, recently realized, is actually the same algorithm as the fairly well-known Ross Selinger algorithm for efficient quantum arithmetic. So you might think, oh, wow, this sounds really weird. But it's not that weird because for any of you that, I don't know if any of you heard Christelle's uh, talk on, on quantum arithmetic, but um, uh, in, in the quantum setting, you have um, 
a, uh, a certain set of gates that you use for operations, like the Clifford gates or the T gates. And these are just um, two by two matrices. And so to, to move around, like to, um, to model quantum arithmetic really means just to um, apply these gates successively. And so when you want to um, do a certain computation, what you really need to, like a, a real computation that we're used to doing with normal classical computers, you have to model that computation in terms of these Q gates, or T gates, sorry, T gates and Clifford gates. And so what you're really doing is finding a path in some sense in this, in this graph, which is whose steps are given by multiplying by these two by two matrices. So it's actually a very, very similar problem. And the algorithm that they came up with is um, later is almost the same um, algorithm as our um, pathfinding algorithm for LPS graphs. So that was just a little aside, but I thought it might be of interest to some people, so I wanted to mention it. Um, but there's other graphs that have been tried, the Morgenstern graph, um, the higher dimensional analogs in dimension um, two and above that I mentioned with um, Charles and Gorin. And then more recently, um, adding level structure to the elliptic curves and looking at that graph. So Sarah Arpin, um, has just finished her PhD, and her paper is available called Adding Level Structure to Supersingular Elliptic Curve Isogeny Graphs. Okay, and then aside from the different graphs that have been considered, there's a whole community of people working on the actually the crypto side of these isogeny, um, isogeny based systems. So alternate graphs and protocols coming from, for example, the Seaside um, proposal, uh, Dimension 2 um, analogs um, proposed by a range, a range of people, including um, the one by Florid and Smith, which I mentioned in my earlier lecture. Um, other signature schemes, which I didn't describe here, attacks, which um, use some of the auxiliary information, such as using um, the, the torsion points that are known, um, and then some of the work I talked about um, with, the, with trying to use the, uh, the graph structure to attack. Okay, so at this point, I would, um, I'm finished with everything that I wanted to say in this uh, series of lectures. I'd be d happy to take more questions. I really enjoyed um, talking with all of you, and I hope you got an idea of one of the proposals for post-quantum cryptography, which is these kind of huge, messy-looking super singular isogeny graphs, which draw on all kinds of beautiful mathematics, ranging from, from elliptic curves curves to quaternion algebras to to Ramanujan graphs so it's really a fruitful area to work in and there's a lot of work to be done so I hope you've learned something from this and that you will hopefully enjoy working in this area thank you okay are there questions Yeah, sorry I didn't say that. So actually, um, I have to dig back into my memory. It's been a while since I've thought about this. Um, so um, you have, um, like over any uh, number field, you have like the central simple algebras. So if they're, let me see if it's this is the right one. So if they're, they're ramified, if um, when you uh, tensor, you get the, M, or sorry, if you tensor and you get the M, just the matrix algebra, then they're unramified. But if, <laughs> if you get the, the different simple, central simple algebra, then they're ramified. Sorry. Yeah, that's a very interesting point. I'm always, whenever I give this talk, I'm always waiting for somebody to ask that question. <laughs> so, um, did everyone hear the question? Okay, so, um, you know, I say like the two isogeny graph is three regular, and if there's no backtracking, you have only two choices after you've taken one step, but how do you decide the first step? So that's the pro basically the question. So there has to be, there are different proposals that you could make, and I'm embarrassed 
to say I'm not sure which one they have taken for psych for example but um, I mean I guess when you do if it's not the hash function um, no you still have the same problem for psych yeah the <laughs> same problem for both so you have to throw one of them out and there's different deterministic ways to do it and possibly there are bad ways to do it I'm not sure if anyone has shown that there's any bad choices for how to do it Yana, do you know how they do it? Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> you already have specified, yeah, great. So I'm not sure if everyone heard that, but so instead of starting at the starting point of 1728, you already take one, one step and you start at that point. And so you can't go backwards now. So thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, let's thank Kristen Lodger again.